I'm Adam Gopnik, and tonight's program is dedicated to the idea of the old country, which is what my grandfather called this country from the day he arrived here at the age of 12 till the day he died, inevitably, in Florida uh, at the age of 88. Uh, he was on that same program that took you from Russia to Ellis Island and then to Fort Lauderdale. Um, <laughs> we will talk tonight about the literature of emigration, the literature of expatriation, the transformation of language within a single sensibility, the coexistence of two languages within that same sensibility, the discovery of the new world from the haunted old one, and the rediscovery of the old world from the cleansed new one. And joining us are three extraordinary writers, young novelists who have taken that kind of traffic, mental and actual, as their special subject. They are uh, Tia Albrecht, Gary Steingart, and Jonathan Safran Forer. And would you join me in welcoming them, please? Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, let me talk first, to, if I may, ask you all about, except you, Jonathan, because uh, I know you, this is not part of it, the experience of English, of actually getting English. We have sort of two models in English literature for people who come from elsewhere who then become writers, significant writers in English. We have Joseph Conrad, who was Polish and then came upon English very, very late, Vladimir Nabokov, who by his own account, was fluent in English, French, and Russian by the time he was four years old, um, and equally able to write in, in all of them. Um, Taya, you were born in Yugoslavia, lived for a long time in Cyprus, as I, as I understand. What was your first experience of speaking English, understanding English, and reading English? Um, it, they were sort of not the same experience. I first heard and learned English through Disney films, bootleg Disney films that my grandfather would like smuggle from Italy to Yugoslavia. Your, your native language, your first language being? Uh, Serbo-Croatian. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, <laughs> sorry, I was gonna say, but now different, but still the same. Um, so I memorized them, I would watch them repeatedly and sort of could rattle off the whole script of the movie by heart um, without understanding a single thing of what was going on. I mean, sort of, uh, a vague understanding of it, I guess, like, this is a villain, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's the good guy, but apart from that, and it drove my mother insane. But you had this phonetically memorized. Yes, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then when we moved to Cyprus, we left in, in 92 when the, when the war started, um, or just before the war in started. In the war in Yugoslavia started. Yeah, um, and uh, ended up in, on the Greek side of Cyprus, and I went to British school, uh -huh. uh, where I very learned, sorry, try that again, <laughs> where I'm still struggling with English. <laughs> <laughs> where I learned very quickly uh, that people, you know, didn't necessarily communicate the same way the characters in Dumbo did, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> um, and uh, started learning to well, read. No, and understand. This takes us a little farther afield, but of course in your wonderful novel, The Tiger's Wife, um, the Jungle Book plays a, a hugely important role, Kipling's The Jungle Book. Now, was that one of the, the cartoons that you saw? It was, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So that was how you were introduced to the Jungle Book? That was how, well actually, the Jungle Book was the first book that I read in, Serb, in, in Serbo-Croatian, and then the first book that I was able to read by myself in English as well, so the movie was like supplemental material. So the Jungle Book is really your Rosetta Stone, you know it, it in, really, every yes, imaginable, it <laughs> in every imaginable language, yes. you are expert in, in the Jungle Book. Uh, Jerry, this is not your first name, this was not the first name that you were given. No, I was born Igor. Igor, not Igor. You were trying to. Before Igor is horrifying. It's like Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Igor. 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 <laughs> the R is trilled. Right. And you Igor. came to what my grandfather would call this country when you were seven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah seven. Um, so I just learned English last year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a requirement at Columbia where I teach. <laughs> I, I'm surprised to hear that, actually. <laughs> it doesn't sound real. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I, I learned it when I was, uh, well, I came to this country and I, I, was sent, uh, I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for some crime I never committed. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, I can name the crime, it's being Jewish, but. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, but uh, yeah, I remember the warrant for my arrest. Um, and so uh, I was immediately plunged into English and Hebrew. Um, right. and let me stop you a second. Um, you came, in a sense, at a couple of removes as a refugee from 
from war. Yes, right. Yeah. And ref refugee. You were refugee. <laughs> <laughs> but you said once you, were, you were a wheat Jew. You were, you were basically traded for a bushel of wheat. Yes. So in 1979, the Soviet Union finally ran out of wheat and out of high technology. And Jimmy Carter very nicely decided to exchange uh, me for about three loaves of bread. Uh, <laughs> I don't know who got the better deal. <laughs> <laughs> So learning I English. I feel yeasty. <laughs> learning English. So you suffer through Hebrew school. Oh, I So you're, you're, you speak Russian and Hebrew then. I, don't, I forgot all the Hebrew. But mm -hmm. what was interesting is, so I didn't, I, I couldn't, we didn't speak English in the house. And my mm -hmm. parents wanted me to retain my Russian, which I did. But we weren't allowed, we didn't have a television set. I was living in, you know, lady with lapdog land. I thought everything was about Chekhov and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, but... So eventually, I started writing and speaking English was because I wanted to write a satire of the Torah, mm -hmm. which was what we were learning. So <laughs> I, I wrote it on an actual scroll, and it was called. It, you can un unroll it. Yeah, it was called. It was called the Genorah, <laughs> and uh, you know, Exodus became Sexodus and stuff like that. And people hated me before that because it was the Reagan era. You know, all those movies: Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster. <laughs> And that's how I made my first friends, was because uh, kids hated the Hebrew education and they would laugh with me at the rabbi. It was sort of the Mad Magazine version of the exactly, Torah. And the exactly. And I never stopped, you know. And that never was stopped. So did you have a jungle book? Did you have a, a, a book in English that meant a great deal to you, that there from, was the, sort of from the canon? There was a book, a child's book, uh, about Harriet Tubman and, ha and the Underground Railroad. It was a very simple book. Uh, but something about the theme of slavery and escaping from somewhere and being spirited away resonated with me. I didn't realize at the time that maybe it was the experience of leaving the Soviet Union, but in hindsight, obviously, that's what it was. Jonathan, you, like me, are from this country rather than from the old country. I, I sort of smuggle in here as an expatriate because I am an expatriate Canadian, which is very much the non-alcoholic version of expatriation. <laughs> um, we go back and forth quietly across the border if Russian expatriation is pure vodka. Ours is sort of sweet cider. But Jonathan, you were born in this country. And then as you grew and as you began to contemplate writing fiction, you became fascinated with the experience of the old country. I, be, I was fascinated with it from the beginning. You know, I was born in, I have these two halves of my family. I was born in DC, not just in America, but in you know, the seat of democracy. And um, uh, the, I guess the so-called seat of democracy. And um, I mean, we're, you're among friends. <laughs> I, 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 I know for a fact that I'm not. Um, I, 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 um, half of my family had been in the States for several mm -hmm. generations. My father's side, my mother was born in Poland and, um, and came to the States when she was seven. And, um, you know, half of the family really was most comfortable in Yiddish and half the family was most comfortable. So was Yiddish one of your first languages? Well, no. I mean, I, I knew some words, the same words that you know, the cab driver who took me here knows. Right. Um, I was familiar with the gesticulation, the Yiddish gesticulation. Not, not the words per se, but the way that the words were delivered. Right. And, um, and so I, ha I had these two halves of the experience. And, and growing up, you know, I guess what we're calling the old country tonight it was never a distant place, mm -hmm. it was never a foreign place. So if, if I'm just, it, it wasn't, your experience in that sense wasn't like the experience of a lot of us whose parents came over in the teens or the early 20s, where it really was the old country. It was a repository of myth that was very remote. Your, your experience was much more immediate and actual. Well, we had these sort of absent myths. I mean, that's what was so strange about it and what was so affecting. Um, you know, an absent myth is more, leaves a stronger impression than a present myth. And we knew the outlines of the stories that we weren't being told. You know, we knew exactly what it was that we weren't talking about. We just never talked about it. Um, the it being, um, you know, the Holocaust and, and why the family tree um, was pruned in the particular way that it was. Um, so even growing up, I knew that from, I mean, I, I, ne I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know that, when I wasn't aware of the fact that we weren't talking about these things. And so in a way, coming into writing was engaging with those, with those silences rather than engaging with a place that was foreign to me or a culture that was foreign to me. And that's what led you on um, the process that, that ended with everything is illuminated with, in your first novel. Yeah, you know, but it wasn't, it really wasn't deliberate. That's the, the, the sort of interesting thing. No, nothing I've ever written has been delivered in, in quite that way, but this was especially instinctive. I, but am I right in thinking, Jonathan, that the, 
when you first had the impulse towards that story, it was nonfiction that you were going to pursue. It wasn't even writing necessarily. Uh -huh. I, I, in the summer after my um, sophomore year of college, I remember being at the top of a stairwell on the way halfway up to my dorm room and thinking, yeah, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do this summer. I don't really wanna get a job, but I can't do nothing. And I called home and it was like, a, it was a, an unanticipated call. I called home and I said you know, to my mother, can you remind me something about where, where grandpa came from, where your, where your father came from? And wasn't he sort of saved by somebody? Very, very vague. I knew the outlines of the story, but not, not the story itself. And by the end of the call, I had decided that I was gonna go to the Ukraine, and I did, not, not as research for writing, and not as research for personhood, just really. Curiosity, and, Yeah. Uh, and did you speak any Russian or Ukrainian at that No, at that no, no, none. It would, have, it would have made a different trip, and it would have made no book, right. probably. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, as you said, you <laughs> said, I, I, somebody told me you said once that it was like going to, it was like being the remote ancestor, uh, descendant of a, of a prairie Indian and having a picture of your grandfather and going to North Dakota and saying, do you know this man? Well, that's exactly what I did. I, I mean, but, but that, that was not because it, it's hard to describe why that, it happened that way, why it played out that way. But there were things that we were protecting one another from within the family. Um, so, you know, asking my grandmother's permission to go was something I couldn't do, which meant asking, you know, what her maiden name was, what the, you know, village she lived in was called. There's a whole string of questions. Everything resonated out from these original silences. Um, which are loving silences. They weren't anything but loving silences. So the necessary amnesia of people who have suffered enough. Not, I don't know if it's amnesia so much as protecting others, uh -huh. or, or the effort to protect others, which they remember perfectly well. But, yeah, right. yeah, but you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't mm -hmm. work like that in, in life. When you try to protect somebody, you're usually not protecting them. Um, so I went armed with nothing but some curiosity, and maybe more important than curiosity, I was armed with. Um, you know, being 17 or, or however old I was, you know, I, it, I, was, a, I was like on a, a hinge and I was, I was really impressionable. I was really open to a trans, transformative experience. I wanted it. And so when I encountered the nothing that I encountered, which is what I had to encounter, both because there's nothing to find there. I mean, there's not even rubble to find. And I had no information with me. I wasn't asking intelligent questions. When somebody who is open to a transformative experience encounters nothing, he generates a transformative experience. And, and so the book was, was my response to this, this, this whole. In, in, that, in that too. I, I want to come back to that whole question of the way that fiction, what you three write, uh, exactly is designed sort of or fills those kinds of spaces that are left by history in a certain way. But before I do, I, I wanted to ask all of you about the fundamental, the foundation on which all of us build, and that is the English language and your feelings about it, your relation. You know, I was in, in preparing for tonight, I was reading a biography of Conrad, who is sort of the model emigre writer, the guy who comes from one country and totally masters another language. And I was surprised to learn that Conrad was equally skillful in French and in English. And when someone asked him, why didn't you choose to write in French? Why did you write in English? He said, because when you write in French, you have to get it right. Um, and in English, he said, is infinitely more flexible and you can make a lot more mistakes and no one will blame you. And of course, anyone who's but lived is in- that, Is that a remark about the French people or the French language? I think he meant, it, I mean, I think the two things are so organically joined that you can't separate them. He meant, and anyone who has lived in France or written French will know that it is, that the culture of French at least, if not the language in some absolute sense, is one that is pettifogging about the details of, accents and of, and of usages, and English, according to Conrad, had a more, uh, a more fluid and a more, uh, uh, was more of a harbor for other experiences. Tay, did you find that deciding to write in English was, was a convenience, a choice? Has it altered the way you write your fiction? You know, I, I think that it was, a, by, by the time I started writing, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think there was any choice to be made anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was seven when I started speaking it and under, you know, understanding what words meant. Um, and uh, you know, it was the first language that I really learned to write in. Uh, I had a very interesting experience with, you know, we we spoke and we still speak Serbo-Croatian in in, in my you house. Do. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and I am, you know, fluent. But the Serbo-Croatian that I'm fluent in is like my grandmother's Serbo-Croatian. So. Um, 
when I went back to Belgrade for the first time in 2003, <laughs> 2003 and started talking to people of my generation, I mean, there was a, you know, I was roundly made fun of because it, you know, it was full of all these. Um, you were speaking the language of I, the old country. I was speaking exactly. You know, I would I would say something to the tune of like, you know, I, I don't even know, like 1950s detective, you know, noir. Like, ah, oh, these these dames are, you know, really. <laughs> I, I just, no joke. And these people, dames you know, are foxy. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I can't think. I would like to give a better example than that, but um, <laughs> yes, it was it. all about all about foxy dames. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, really quickly had sort of a crash course in like swearing and, uh, you know, what you call objects now. <laughs> like computers, which my grandmother didn't have names for, you know, it was just like the calculator. Mm. Um, <laughs> the big calculator. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, so, you know, English really, despite appearances, right now was the language in which I was most comfortable and, you know, in, in which I was able to communicate on, on paper. But, but the, if, if I read you correctly, the, the literature you were most interested in wasn't in English. It, right. Mm -hmm. Right. It was translated. And this was something that would have been really helpful to know before I signed up for college to, for English. I, comparative literature was the, the something that I really wanted were, to do. <laughs> the writers who moved you were right. Russian and South American. Yeah. Absolutely, um, and and it was uh, you know Bulgakov and Dostoevsky and Marquez and Borges and I you know I and I didn't this is something another sort of cultural problem like I did not know that you know translated into English does not mean English literature okay. so and you chose to study English literature which included none of the writing you liked yes. <laughs> you, you liked it Gary you um, keep you are still. Fluently bilingual, and, and your mind works in both Russian and English at the same time? Yeah, it's like having two different soundtracks, and they come in at different times. When I'm writing, it's English, but there's always a, the dialogue is always in a Russian loop. Um, stressful things, like when we grew up, we had no US currency. So whenever I go to the bank and the 20, 40, 60 comes out, 20, 40, 60 comes out. <laughs> uh, horrible dreams, all the nightmares are in Russian. Um, I was in a disastrous airplane flight uh, that was. Uh, turned around and forced to land last week, and, and boje moi, boje moi, oh my god, oh my god. So all the primal moments of sexual passion? <laughs> oh, boje moi. Lenin. Yes. So in, in a sense, your, your id still plays in Russian, and even if your ego is going in, yeah. in English. And that's because I, I talk to my parents every week in, in, in Russian, uh, and I go back to Russia every year. To, to suffer a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> those, all those years of Hebrew school weren't sufficient. To, Not enough. To, <laughs> it's <laughs> just a little, you feel the morsel. Yeah. <laughs> and that, too. Jonathan, your experience, and everybody jump in here. I I'm, I'm, don't intend to go up and down like a timpani player um, from one to another. So just jump in at any moment. But Jonathan, you are uh, uh, an English speaker, but with this particular proximity to other, other tongues and other sounds. Yeah, I mean, it's. Something that, that surprised me when I became um, a writer was that I, I was choosing narrators who didn't speak English perfectly. <laughs> right. You know, whether it was a, a Ukrainian translator or a younger person, um, I liked when when someone's. Um, I mean, look, every writer's abilities hit, hit a wall at some point. You know, you're not saying the thing that you want to say. Every speaker's abilities hit a wall. And I like just making that explicit, you know, making the, the, the struggle explicit. I thought there was something really sympathetic about it. You know, somebody who, especially somebody who is like a dreamer, who has a very active imagination and um, is um, romantic in a right. sense, um, having, um, you know, a, a, an especially limited vocabulary it just excited me. Well, it would be fair to say, Jonathan, in a certain sense, you expatriate your own characters. That, that is, you, you create a kind of estrangement for them to enrich your fiction. It's also just the kind of character I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, unproblematic people aren't interesting in life or in fiction. Um, there's the old saying, once upon a time, there, w there was a, a, a man whose life was so good there was no story to tell about it. Um, so. When you can compound problems, you don't want to, you don't have to, com, you know, compound narrative problems. You can give them verbal problems. You can give them, um, you know, all, 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 all sorts of things that will that will um, 
make them foreigners. Yeah, foreigners are the best guides. Foreigners are the most sympathetic guides. The most interesting to, is in, in that way. Is, do, you, do you both feel that way as well? Because it's a very important theme in both of, both of your work. I remember when I was headed to Paris when, in what I thought were, were very Tony circumstances, the great artist, Saul Steinberg, the great uh, New Yorker associated artist, though God knows he transcended this institution, said to me, ah, he said, you have decided not to forego the essential Jewish experience of emigration and expatriation. And I thought he was joking, but of course he was absolutely right. Any place you go and you become estranged is a place that immediately becomes a subject. Is that, is that important to your work too? Yeah, I, I, I travel to places that I don't understand and I live there to suffer there too. So, I mean, the places are Italy. <laughs> it doesn't sound so bad, but... And, and I but any place where you're not understood. Yeah. Not understood, and I purposely don't learn the language just to feel what the parish <laughs> itself. At that moment. Yeah, at that moment, yeah. yeah. I am. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, now travel for, for pleasure has certainly become sort of an inspirational mechanism for me, but um, when, when, when I was a kid, you know, the, the move to Cyprus was forced, the move to Egypt was forced, and then the move to the, to the U.S. was, you know, greatly anticipated, but still sort of not, you know, you're a kid, you like, pack your bag, go. And, um, I mean, with your parents, not... Um, and only but, speaking Disney dialogue. Right, only point. Disney dialogue, all day. Right. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, uh, the places that we ended up, um, they had very interesting histories. And as a result, it immediately became something in which, you know, I was gr infinitely more interested in than what I was coming from. Um, and then uh, immediately nostalgic about the moment we left. So it was sort of this uh, retroactive kind of cauldron of material. It, c coming together. By the way, please don't think I'm checking my email at this <laughs> point. I just, I condensed um, six novels onto a a few sentences here to refer to. In your most recent book, Garrett, you, um, the iPhone is completely archaic technology in the future that you imagine. Well, I feel like an immigrant twice. I, I, I came from Russia, which was a, another planet, much, not even another country, uh, and now I'm a, a refugee from analog technology, <laughs> from books and, and the S electric IBM. Uh, now you have these iTelephones and the hot mail. <laughs> and I'm bewildered. Again, I don't know what the hell's going on. People say, <laughs> Skype me. And I'm like, Skype you too, man. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you know, so it gets worse and worse as, as I grow older. Right. But you know, right, that leads to a question, because two things seem to be happening in, in if you look at the world. One is, is that the world becomes more united in a certain way, and at the same time seems to become less literate, less concerned with the kinds of things that literary fiction takes on typically or, or, or traditionally. Um, all of you have written about that to one degree or another, about your ambivalences, or you've actually tried writing for forms, I know you have, Jonathan, outside of the novel, the novel proper in, it, in, its, in its bindings. Do you all still feel a, a, an unbreakable sense of affiliation with novels and covers, or do you feel that you are, in effect, the last generation to be washed up on those shores as well? Anyone? I think we are the last generation to be washed up on those shores. I do. I, that makes me sad. I don't think that's a good thing. But the novel can't compete with fragmented media, and it can't compete with distractions. And uh, unless Apple and Amazon tell us that the platforms for novel reading are going to be ex exclusively used for novel reading, then novels will just die. Or, or they're going to change really, really dramatically. Because you know, I have nothing against an e-reader, but the, the problem is when an e-reader also offers you other things. You know, a book doesn't offer you anything else. It's an immersive experience. And because of that, it's very, very intimate. And it's slow. And it depends on that intimacy. And you know, as the platforms make email available and your calendar available, and they they beep when someone sends you a message. Um, it takes a superhuman to resist that. Um, I am incapable of resisting those kinds of calls because they, they literally make your brain happy. And novels don't make your brain happy in, in, in those small ways. They make your brain happy in, in a very slow and long way, which is more valuable, but um, it can't compete with, with the little bursts. And so, it, you know, 
either, either the novel will find ways to compete with fragmented media, which would be really sad because you'd lose the intimacy in favor of a really cheap kind of gratification, or it's going to be left to, to, you know, like the kinds of people who go to record stores to buy vinyl because they think it sounds better. Right, or you were saying, I know Gary, once you were saying that it would be like poets who write poetry for other poets and yeah, I think poetry departments. I think uh, Franzen put it best that, you know, fiction is the new poetry. Uh, and that's very sad. <laughs> but Me meaning that it will be used, I think, you know, uh, uh, some of us teach in the universities and it becomes something for academia. You know, uh, the way poetry already is, there are very few readers of poetry. There's still some, thank God. But, you know, mostly people teach writing in the university and the people who consume it are in the university themselves, either as students or instructors. Right. Um, I also, I mean, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's terrible, but it is, it's not in good shape. Uh, it, tr turning on a device is like going to a party with all these different people screaming for your attention. And the book, which I think is this incredible technology, Think about it. I mean, you open it up, and all of a sudden, you're in the mind of another human being. It's like something out of Star Trek. It's this Vulcan mind melt happening. All of a sudden, you are a Pakistani cab driver in London. What other technology can deliver you so swiftly into another person's mind? But who has the time for it? We're being bombarded with packets of information day in and day out. A, a white-collar worker comes home. The last thing she wants to do is open up and, and have 300 more pages of text right. to read. And, and, and the results are stunning and it's not just America. I always diss on, on our uh, reading habits but I was in Russia, I was in St. Petersburg State which is the Yale to Moscow State's Harvard and I, I was supposed to speak to all these humanities uh, students, young bright-eyed students and I thought oh I'm gonna be clobbered because I don't know all my Turgenev sportsman sketches by heart and I walk in this beautiful woman raised her hand and says um, do you think they're gonna turn Avatar into a novel? <laughs> <laughs> and it went down from there. <laughs> And I thought it's just, it's just the way we are now. We, we, all we can do is, is, is catch narrative in this very passive form from the screen. And some of the stuff is amazing. I mean, I'm not, The Wire and, and, and Homeland and stuff like that is just incredible. But it is very sad that what we grew up with uh, is, is going to be very much but in decline. Can I argue with you guys uh, to this degree? I'm a little bit older than all of you, one generation ahead. And I remember exactly the same discourse, the same set of things being said in 50 years ago, God help us, in the 1960s. Gore Vidal talked about the total academicization of the novel. Bill Sheed wrote a piece about the death of the novel. That was a half century ago. And look out here tonight, and look at, and look at the three of you here. And, when, and your books are read, certainly, are praised. When you get made one of the New Yorkers under 40s, you excite enormous rage and jealousy in your contemporaries. I don't know a better register of significance than the ability to create anger in others. Um, <laughs> It, isn't this part of a sort of recurring story that every generation has to tell itself? The novel is dying, the novel is dying, and yet the novel never really dies. So we, we continue to read it, and we continue to find new novelists who, who count. I mean, I do think that, that there is some sort of appeal, and I, I think, and I am only of my generation, so I, I cannot speak for future ones, but, uh, or past ones, but um, I, do, I do get the sense that there is this, like, there is a feeling of wanting to be the guardian of like some sort of just about to be um, obsolete right. relic of humanity. You know what I mean? Like you're the last. And and I, I think that I do think that people's connection to the physical object that books are, um, in some ways, is, is absolute. I, I think that the first way, and this is sort of I mean this is addressing the problem in a, in a totally cosmetic 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 manner, but um, the first thing I do when I walk into somebody's house is go to their bookshelf. I mean, especially if they're not looking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> especially if they're off entertaining other people, then I'm like, oh yeah. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly a way to get to, to know someone um, intimately very, very quickly, and you form these associations with, with total strangers when you, right. you know, see, when you see them reading in the park, when you see them reading on the subway. Um, you know, when you, when you see Have you ever encountered anyone reading your own book? I encountered one, one person one time um, on the subway. She came onto the subway and like held it directly in front of my face and I spent her five minute ride going like this. <laughs> uh, Just sending brainwaves saying, yeah. look at the author photo, look at the author photo, right? But she didn't, <laughs> which probably just as well because she would have been like, wow. <laughs> but, um, but, but it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a way of presenting yourself. I mean, it's a way of presenting your mind and, and you know, the, 
um, what you're made of and the, you know, the certain kind of aesthetic. And um, I think that people, people who read literature, people who love literature need that and want that and uh, want that connection in other, others. Um, and I think that it's something that will preserve the novel at least for a little bit. I think though that, that in, in a way my, my disagreement is in, inside of what she said, which is it's a presentation of the mind. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the internet different from the advent of the moving image or television mm -hmm. or radio. All of the things that in the past have competed with it is that those are different articulations of the same mind and the internet changes our mind. You know, that I don't meet people who have the same ability to concentrate that they had 10 years ago. People just don't. People don't have the ability to stay with something for the same length of time that they did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know anybody who does. I don't know people who feel less distracted than they did 10 years ago. What, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember. That's my point. Um, there's a really wonderful book called The Shallows, um, which Nicholas I find Carr myself Carr. recommending all the time. Nicholas Carr. Nicholas, Nicholas Carr. Carr. And he talks about how... I, what I reviewed it. Oh, did you? You don't remember. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> uh, I mean, it's possible I didn't read the review in the first place, but I probably did. Um, I, know, I know I read the book. And, and what made such a strong impression was you know, his, his argument is that this is not only changing the contents of our thoughts, it's changing our ability to think. And, and what's scary is not really the novel disappearing. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that the novel satisfies disappearing. It's our hunger for what the novel satisfies. People lose their hunger for intimacy. People lose their hunger for a prolonged emotional experience. But do, do you really think, John, because Gary's just saying, you know, that one of the things that seems to be taking some of the sort of psychic or social place of the novel are these long form television series, right? And don't they, however, you know, however we want to rate them, don't they serve exactly the same function? I mean, there is no more slow moving story in 19th century French fiction than Mad Men. It crawls along. <laughs> week after week, barely occupying the next small space in the narrative, and yet millions of people are addicted to finding out how uh, Don will feel about uh, Peggy next week. I mean, isn't but, that exactly the, sp the space, the psychological novel? No, absolutely not, because they're, they're passive experiences. You're addicted to finding something out which will be revealed to you, whereas a novel is an experience that makes you complicit in its best form. You know, the best novels are the ones that you that you co-author in some sense, that you don't, not, not that you receive or appreciate or praise. Um, and, and that's what's being lost, is, is the, a kind of culture that asks for participation. You know, because now media is so much um, organized around gratification, satisfaction. Right. Um, Gary, you looked like you were saying, about to say something very sage. <laughs> on the, on the um, well, you guys both mentioned intimacy, and I was thinking about how important when I was coming online as a mm, dater of women, uh, <laughs> how important it was, uh, how important books were. Uh, you would, you know, I remember just riding around the subway with a copy of Ulysses hoping somebody would say, oh, he's so smart, I love him. <laughs> you know, and, and also you would go to somebody's house for the first time and you'd say, oh my God, she just has Glenn Beck on her shelves, that's interesting. <laughs> You would learn about the other person through what they have in their bookshelves, and that's just not possible when it's just a Kindle. The, the super sad whatever the last book I wrote, you know, began. <laughs> you can't even remember the title of your yeah, title. You know, oh, began yeah. with this one incident. It was very simple. A uh, um, Time Warner cable repair person came in, saw that much like the character, the main character, I have this wall of books that just covers my living room, and he said. Oh man, why you got all them books here? <laughs> he was disgusted by it. And then he said, and you have such a small TV. <laughs> so it was disgust followed by emasculation <laughs> of, the size of my units, you know. <laughs> and I realized, and, and many other stories went to confirm this. There was a, a German um, journalist from Der Spiegel interviewing me, and he went to, uh, what's that bar, Schiller's on, on the Lower East Side. And he took out my book just to do some note, take some notes. And he said, people were looking at me like an escaped tiger had come out of a cage. You know, they were <laughs> the shot. one jumped right out of Teo's book. Jumped out of Teo's book, book, except right. they wouldn't like the book. They would just keep right. the tiger. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so the feeling is really is that, that books are, are no, no longer seen as, I, I don't even want them to be objects of desire, but I don't, just, I don't want them to be objects of disgust. And that's how the idea for this book came to me. If, of your, of of your the last, last book. Of, of the last book. Well, that leads me, coming back a little bit to the ostensible subject of our talk tonight. Um, one of the things that seems to me true about all of your work is that there's a certain rueful sense that the old country, 
Europe, the land left behind, is haunted in a way that America may not, may not be. It's certainly a, something, Tay, in your, in your book that's very, that's very important. I wondered if you could talk about, about that a bit. There's a certain, even with all of the, the um, sort of folkloric ugliness and horrors that happen, nonetheless, there's a kind of density of experience, that kind of village density you talk about that's, that's something that you still have a pang for. Well, I think that, um, you know, it's, <laughs> there's, I think that there's layers of, especially being removed from, let me finish one sentence before I start <laughs> another. Um, in, in being removed from something like, um, you know, your, your past in, in Europe, like your, your roots in, in Yugoslavia, or my roots in Yugoslavia, not everybody's roots in Yugoslavia. Um, there's, there's a sense Tonight we are all Yugoslavia. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there is this sense of, of, you know, immediate nostalgia, I think. And, um, you know, this, this desire to explore and understand these complex layers of w oneself. And, you know, I think that, and I don't know if this is something that, that, that you found going back, but there's um, the layers of lies, and we tell protective lies in my family too all the time. In fact, my mother doesn't think I'm here tonight. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you know, there's what, what, why? What did she <laughs> say? I mean, that's a very easy <laughs> lie to have <laughs> revealed. I'm at, Mom, I'm at the New Yorker Festival. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this would, uh, you know. She's an Atlantic subscriber. And <laughs> right, that's it. No, um, <laughs> damn, if only I'd come up with that. So, so <laughs> on the spot, the, um, you know, there's this sense of uh, a a journey that's being, a, a mental journey that's being undertaken just sort of by virtue of your own curiosity. It's <laughs> like, I'm curious about it, and now I am an adventurer. And I, I think that um, getting past all the layers of sort of family history and family politics, and then, I mean, in particular, in, in something like the former Yugoslavia, and in particular in a family like mine, which is ethnically mixed and so sort of neutral, um, but still gets very angry at the TV at times <laughs> uh, when, when the news is on about this these particular subjects. Um, Th these particular subjects mean the old wars. Yeah, and, right. yeah. Um, there's this, you know, this sense of, of really having to dig very deep and, and um, to, to understand anything at all. And uh, it all seems so mysterious and it all seems so inaccessible in, in every way that I think it's a, it's a natural draw. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that answers the question at all. But no, no, I, I, think, I, I think it does, that you're just continually drawn to, towards a past that you recognize is filled with war and, and horror and pain, but that nonetheless seems you, you can't dispense with, you can't simply, right, you right, can't simply cut off from. I, I, I have the feeling, Gary, in your new book, too, that there's a sense in which, which is a kind of, um, what can we call it, sort of Orwell come go go parody of the United States as it will shortly be or as it is rapidly becoming. Um, and where you can't come back to the country if you've gone away without going through a kind of re-education program to be let back in. There's only one political party, the bipartisan party, which is self-congratulatory in every way, and, and so on, that there's, there's a sense that um, that's the, if not the approaching American reality, that's the American reality, and that there's something cleansed, hygienic, hyper-efficient, and deeply uh, shallow, deep, well, deeply shallow, false about that in every way. And that is, am I right in thinking there's a certain kind of uh, feeling that sloppy and messy, though the old world was, at least it wasn't that. Yeah, you know, uh, in writing this book, I, I became a kind of patriot of America because I began to realize how much we've lost so quickly. Um, and this has happened, this is deja vu for me. I grew up, the Soviet Union was a terrible place, no question about it, but I grew up in love with it. I loved it. We lived in the biggest, we had the biggest statue of Lenin outside of our apartment in Moscow Square, Plochid, Moscow Square. And he was looked like this, we called him the Latin Lenin because he was <laughs> about to break into dance, <laughs> you know. And I loved him and every morning, it was a difficult family in many ways, but every morning I'd get up and I'd hug his pedestal. <laughs> and my grandmother, who, who died in Leningrad, she never came, who I loved so dearly and she was a correspondent for the uh, evening Leningrad. And when I was four or five, I was about five, and she said, can you write a novel for me? You know, typical Jewish-Russian grandmother request. Can you just write a novel for me? You're five, <laughs> Jesus Christ, I mean. <laughs> my, Gary, my Igor can write anything. My Igor is better than Misha over there, because he's just writing a novelette, whatever that is. 
So she commissioned the novel, uh, and it was about, and she said, write about Lenin, because we both love, she was an ardent communist, she said, let's write about Lenin. I wrote 100 pages in very big Cyrillic scripts uh, about uh, Lenin meets a magical goose, and they <laughs> invade Finland together, to <laughs> and they start a socialist revolution, <laughs> and then there's a kind of Menshevik-Bolshevik argument, and Lenin eats the goose. <laughs> So sort of like Dorothy eating Toto. In the exactly. <laughs> and Grandma loved it. And she paid me, in and she, she said, maybe cut out the part about him eating the goose. Uh, but she paid me in little pieces of cheese for each page I wrote, which is how Random House still pays me. <laughs> <laughs> but there was this association of you write something, and somebody loves you. This woman loves you unconditionally, gives you cheese, gives you sustenance, you know, understands who you are. And that, that, that was it. After that, I never stopped writing. Right. But you had, so, but that, where, is the Statue of Lenin still there, or was it gone? It's in the absolutely <laughs> still there. If anyone goes to St. Petersburg, which is now what Leningrad is called, uh, straight from the airport, it's one of the first big squares you see. Lenin is still there. Nothing, Russia is amazing in, the, in, in a sense, nothing really changes. It, it's a wonderful country to write about because things have always sucked and will suck forever. <laughs> uh, there's a restaurant in Petersburg called 1913, and I asked the owner, why 1913? And she said, it was the only good year in Russian history. <laughs> <laughs> and for a satirist, it's priceless to have a country like that, and it's also priceless now to have a country like this. Which cannot tolerate the idea of unhappiness or any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, immiseration. Exactly. Jo Jonathan, you and I write from the opposite direction, that is, as people who came of age in this, in a, in a largely prosperous and, and peaceful place, but are still to some degree drawn towards that other experience and, and still in some ways imagine it as not deeper than um, more significant? Well, it's, I mean, it's one of the questions, it, it can become a little bit dangerous to what extent the invent, the, the attraction is, is hubristic or narcissistic or... Sentimental. Yeah, like uh, am I... Um, I, I mean, and I was aware of this actually when I was writing Everything is Illuminated, a kind of, you know, people are not mythological creatures. They were not mythological creatures. They weren't whimsical. They weren't magical. And yet I did write about them that way. And they were no more interesting than the people we know. Right. I mean, they were the people that we know just right. in a different place. And, um, and, you know, my solution in that book was to have a kind of counterpoint, a character who would call this Jonathan the hero on these imaginings and, and sort of it was in a, just a metafictional way I would question the story that I was telling. But, you know, it's something that I've thought about a lot, you know. And, and also something we haven't talked about is just the question of manipulation or... In manipulation in what sense? Um, claiming... Um, a country that really isn't ours, <laughs> or you know, using it for the benefit of art, um, or using it because they are handy mythologies. It's something that I have felt increasingly sensitive to. I mean, these are not places that um, there's a reason we didn't talk about them. You know, there's a reason my grandmother doesn't like to talk about them, and yet, so what? What, what does it mean if I am devoting myself to writing about them, especially if there's an aspect of secrecy, which there always sort of has been with my with my writing in relationship to, to my family. And, you know, is it, there's a, there's a generous way of looking at it and then there's an ungenerous way of looking at it. The generous way is it's a reckoning, it's a coming to terms, it's like an honest appraisal, it's maybe even redemptive. Responsibility you know. to history and certain. Yeah, and not yeah. only that, but, but um, calling heroes heroes instead of the, calling them victims, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, you know, the other way, the less generous way of looking at it is, Fancy, fancy young guy in a fancy college, doesn't know what to do one summer, has this ridiculous trip for three days and writes a fancy novel about it. Weaves a spell of sort yeah. of Chagall-like. Uh, yeah, so folklore. neither is right, obviously. It's a little bit of both. Um, but I hope I'm saved by, my, <laughs> by at least my sensitivity to... Or self-consciousness about the possibility that... Yeah, and I'll, I mean, also... There are a lot of different levels in which world in which a piece of writing exists. You know, it exists in the world of strangers, but it also exists in the world of intimates. And and it was a good thing in in my family. I mean, it it's been good finding ways, even if they are really con. You know, in a way, my novel is like a, a Rube Goldberg Goldberg machine to bring about a conversation in my family. It's like it took a huge number of really unlikely steps just to to 
to alter what my grandmother and I would talk about when we'd play Uno at her kitchen <laughs> table. You know, it's, there, there's something a little bit... So that 1943 would no longer be an invisible card in the family game, you mean? Yeah, right. And that, did it have that effect? Um, to some extent it did, but there's a lot of history behind us, you know, so it's a lot to reckon with. And, um, you know, as our, as our president also knows, change comes slowly. <laughs> so um, it, 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 um, it's not easy, and, and it shouldn't be easy, but... But I think it's something that we're grateful for, just uh, sort of um, like touching on taboos just to see what will happen. And it's never as bad as one fears. And one of your most recent projects, among others, has been um, to do an updated um, Passover service, an updated uh, Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Is that some of the same kinds of feelings that uh, went into, the, into that construction? In a certain sense. I mean, I, it was inspired by a frustration with a way of talking. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I, I've been to... Um, what, 70 satyrs in my life, something like that. And um, do, the, do the math for me there as. Well, 35 as a, times two. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, we celebrate on consecutive nights. And, and um, for as long as I can remember, I've anticipated them with enthusiasm. Right. I mean, it's a really nice event. And my you know, first time, I, the only time I would see all those cousins in the right. course of a year, it's really the only time we'd gather to talk about real themes, really significant themes slavery, the perpetual movement toward freedom when who's a stranger and how we treat the stranger mm -hmm. and so i would approach it with enthusiasm and, and always walk away from it with a little bit of disappointment because uh, uh, the table was set for a really invigorating really beautiful and difficult conversation and um, it was never really had it was never had as i thought it could be and a couple years ago i was looking around the table i mean i emailed you about it 10 years ago yeah. Um, we talked about I'm, it. I'm 10 years late with my contribution, yeah. actually. Uh, there's a second edition, I'm sure. Um, for the second night, which I didn't even know existed <laughs> yeah. until a few minutes ago. Go on. If, if, <laughs> if I had known that you didn't know that, I probably wouldn't have sent that email 10 years ago. But in any case, um, uh, I, I looked around the table a couple years ago, and I thought, you know, half the people here are writers. Like, we devote ourselves right. to, to words, to language, to talking. Why are we so invested in the conversation with strangers and we're so comfortable with inadequate conversations around mm -hmm. our table in our right. homes? So why don't we work on this? And so that, that, was, that was really the impetus was to, and I'm not sure that that was different than the impetus that, that's behind my novels. Uh, right, exactly. You know, to right. change the conversation at home. Around the, to change the conversation at home around a table. Um, I want to throw it open to this audience who I'm sure have uh, many, many questions to ask, but let me raise one last thing before we do. And that is, th there's a, we've been talking tonight a lot about the old country and the new country and the kind of energy that writers of all kinds have always got from that displacement, from the, the virtues, the benefits, the excitement of being expatriated or, or feeling expatriated. Um, but there's another way that I know all of you have, are aware of, of thinking about contemporary literature, and that is that it's transglobal for the first time, that that old division between the old country and the new country, the old language and the new language, is largely evaporating, that that's the single most striking feature of the fiction of our time, that we have truly international, transnational, global fiction for the first time. Is that itself, do you think, a sort of sentimental myth? Is that an impossibility? Or is it something that, that is real and is peculiar to this, to writing in our time? No, I mean, it's, we, we live in a, in a very global age, and I think if, you know, the idea of the great American novel, well, yeah, but some of that great American novel will have to be outsourced to India, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up in two failing empires. I grew up in the Soviet Union, which collapsed, and now I'm living here. Um, and you sense something big happening when, when things like that happen. You know, you sense the xenophobia starts rising. People start blaming people. Uh, what's happening in Arizona is a very potent uh, example of that. And then the, the patriotism, the, the flags get bigger. I was being driven through Ohio and I saw the world's biggest flag, uh, American flag, it must have been as big as this auditorium, over a Hyundai car dealership. <laughs> 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 and that gigantic flag didn't say to me, I'm proud to be an American, it said I'm scared. I'm mm -hmm. scared to be an American because I don't know what the future is going to be. So I'm just going to make this damn thing bigger and bigger. The flags get bigger as the anxiety gets bigger. Exactly. N not all of them have the Ativan that I carry with me. <laughs> 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 so, you know, 
that's, that's basically the, the story I've been given. And often, you know, and I guess, Jonathan, you were talking about falling into some kind of sentimentality. I worry that, that I'm going to be rehearsing this story of these two empires forever, you know, and that, that it will continue to just influence my work to a much greater extent than I wanted it to. Uh, and I almost want to write my way out of it. And the way I'm doing it is I, I'm, I'm actually writing a nonfiction book about my parents and about myself. And, and I want to kind of... About the experience of immigration. And before that, you know, I'm mm -hmm. researching all my mother. My mother keeps very meticulous files with these horrific headers, you know, like uh, children and parents buried alive in Belarus, 1939 <laughs> to 1943. Uh, uh, uncles who lost their fingers in the gulag, yeah. you know. <laughs> Aunts raped by Cossacks in the... In the yeah, the, yeah, the whole... Yeah, so it's a multi-tiered, beautiful accordion of files that I'm looking through. Uh, and, and, and in a way, you know, I would love to one day write about a U.S. Marine who, you know, goes shopping in Pontiac, Michigan, and maybe even Ontario. Maybe I can Monroe it a little bit, you know? <laughs> something, something different, because, you know, the question is, when is this going to stop being what I want to do? Being a novelist. Well, that and being... Witness being, to, being to a, a the collapse of empires. And being a, a professional immigrant. Right, I am ethnic, hear me roar. <laughs> From Taipei to Bangalore, you know. <laughs> Taya, I, I know your work has been affected, as you were saying earlier this evening, much more than by sort of the classics of English literature, by exactly by the classics of this new kind of literature. Yeah, and I, mean, I think that... Um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the act of writing, which is, you know, at its base, a very lonely act, is also y your first impulse towards writing is, is a personal one. Hmm. And uh, for, for me, the, the trigger for, for The Tiger's Wife was the death of my grandfather and sort of the <laughs> psychological impact and trench of that um, and trying to claw my way out of it. And, you know, for me, with the first novel, I had no idea that there would be an audience of any kind, much less like you know a global audience. Like this idea of you know this is, I'm an immigrant. I'm writing in English now. This English is being translated and sent. For, you know, it's it's a it's a very strange thing. But I think that how many languages is it? Is the book thirty seven? Thirty seven. Thirty five. So thirty yeah thirty five. Thirty seven characters. I can't do math. Counting the second night or not in the <laughs> yeah right yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, plus two, <laughs> multiply it by So no. it's in 35 languages. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's out there and in forms that I don't, I mean, you know, I, I get, the, I get the, the, the copies and I don't, I can't read that script. It's like the pictures. You're like, okay. Um, and I, I think that ultimately what's most incredible about it and, and sort of hopeful, and this is going to sound naive and sentimental, but um, I've, oh, I've been yeah, sort of you know, championing sentimentality. Um, the, the idea that you go through an emotional experience, that's the impetus for the work. Something else possibly comes out of it. Suddenly somebody else is reading it and for better or for worse connects to either the same emotional undertow that pulled you in or some other emotional resonance and mm -hmm. that then becomes the reason why they connect to it. And that's, that's a ridiculous thing. I mean, like as a writer, I don't think that, um, you know, at, at, at your base, you're telling a story. And it's, it's, it doesn't become this great thing um, un unless somebody connects to some part of the story. And the fact that there's a possibility for that is, is uh, unbelievable, yeah. I think. Jonathan? Well, I'm not sure exactly what we're... Yeah. we're, I, we're talking, I thought we were, talk <laughs> we were talking as in the original, sort of like a little bit of like a game of telephone, right, yeah. where it changes as we, as we carry on. The thing I wanted you to reflect on, if you would, is the, the other side of... The notion that we're at the end of expatriation, immigration, change. Oh, right. We live in a kind of in a state of perpetual statelessness. Well, it just depends what you mean by statelessness and what you mean by home. You know, every m most works of art and certainly most novels could be probably described as somebody trying to get home. You know, whether it's literally trying to get home or trying to find a home that feels right. And um, I would I would describe my books that way. All the books, actually, up here, and um, so our definitions of home change, and maybe it will no longer be um, an immigrant story of crossing an ocean to find a new home. Maybe it will be, you know, stories of assimilation or um, feeling at home in a country that you're increasingly alienated from. I don't know, but I, I'm sure that that theme, you know, the definitions might change, but I think that the theme will stay the same. 
two or three. Let, let me open it up to the audience. Um, there should be microphones in, the, in both aisles. You can bring, if you raise a hand, I will try and find you. Any lights up here, gentlemen here? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just start, and they'll bring you. I think they're going to bring a mic, mic out here. You can come to the, come to the side. Just sh shout a bit. Hello. Uh, this is really mostly for Taya, because like you, I was born in Yugoslavia and grew up here. And uh, so I just wanted to thank you more than anything for writing a novel that I feel resonates with my personal experience more than any novel ever could. Thank you. But my question is, what's, what's next now? You've done something that's, I mean, beyond anyone's expectation, I think, uh, and it was fantastic. Are you going to go back to that milieu, or are you... Do you even know where you're heading next? I'm actually going to join the circus <laughs> and <laughs> run away. Yeah. Uh, no, I thank you for the thank you for the question. Thanks for saying that. I um I I'm I'm I think that um I've I've been an immigrant in so many places and 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 been displaced in sort of weird cultures throughout my childhood. So that I think that I'm I'm working. From the back right now, so I think that you know Yugoslavia comes first, and and actually the the second novel that I'm working on right now is still not done with the Balkans, but I have a sneaking suspicion that you know Egypt is right around the corner, um, which is sort of horrifying because it's a long way to here, and by then I'll be over there, and then that'll be sort of a strange. Um, so I'll probably be like 50 before I write about the states, and that by then <laughs> you know we'll all be digital, and then that'll. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that. You know, um, certain themes are always going to come up, and, and for me, uh, the act of travel is definitely one of them, and, uh, you know, searching for home <laughs> is another. So. Could, could you imagine going to live someplace, but the, for, I mean, for a long period of time, not just in travel? I, o I, I can always imagine that, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in practice, it's, um, it's a different story. <laughs> I'm so used to it. It's so comfortable now. They have Purell. It's amazing. <laughs> Tasha has just become a New Yorker, which is a terrific thing. Just come back. Someone else. Back in, all the way in the back here. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I got a question for Jonathan, but anybody can respond as they see fit. Um, it's about the really, there's a really lovely moment in Eating Animals when you're talking about your grandmother and how she's escaping the Germans and will just basically eat whatever she can find, and like what you think this woman tells you about. And then she finds the man who offers her pork, and she's like, no, I don't need pork. I'm kosher, of course I don't need pork. Um, and you, know, you say, what were you thinking, Grandma? Like, you could have died. And she says, you know, what's the point of living if there's no meaning in it? Um, and it makes me think of like all of the sort of like the traditions and the rituals that we have in a pretty secular world now that the rational mind can feast on as meaningless and unimportant, but like preserve a sense of family and a sense of sort of lived history that gives us purpose in our lives. And I'm wondering just about that push and pull and how it affects how you all live your lives and how you all write your books. The place of ritual, the persistence of ritual, the invention of ritual. Mm. Um, that, that is a really complicated question to answer, which is, I think, almost best answered in a book than, than in an answer. But, um, you know, it's something I think about a lot. And it's something I think about a lot more now that I have kids. Um, because it's one thing to um, it, it's one thing to walk away from something. It's another thing um, you know, not to allow someone the the choice of walking away from it. It's like somebody once said, you know, I send my my I, I hope I hope to raise kids who will reject the same things that you know I rejected. I want to arm them with the education that will allow, that they will be able to reject when they're older. Um, so, you know, eating animals is all about that. What you just said. I mean, that 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 was how I came to the whole question of what to eat because. Like every everyone else who's ever eaten a meal, it's not as simple as caloric intake. You know, 
Like we live in families and in, and in communities and in cultures and um, what we eat is, I think, more than probably anything else we do in the course of a day bound up with those identities. And it was very, very strongly bound up with my familial identity, my Jewish identity, my identity as an American. Um, and um, it's, it's actually those questions that most excite me in writing, whether it's nonfiction or, or fiction, especially now that writing has become a ritual in my life, which it wasn't when I began. I mean, I end up doing it a little bit like um, going to synagogue or something, not in the sense that it has yeah. any kind of Have religious... Have you had on in your... <laughs> my yarmulke? But no, no. Um, but, but in the sense that I don't want to do it, but know right. that I should. That's, that's what I meant. <laughs> Um, that I want to be the person who has done it, even though I don't want to do it. Someone, someone else? Isn't there a sense in which one of the things that's in, in all of your writing is about how you end up with these kinds of odd Alexandrian rituals, rituals that are made up of lots of different bits and pieces of, of experience? In that. Well, I mean, I'm also, sorry, were you gonna, you were, I oh. didn't even look. Oh, huh. um, Go, go, go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm OCD, so I'm all about rituals, first of all. But um, I, I think that, um, especially coming from, from Yugoslavia and, and from, a, from a mixed family. Um, it mixed was in, in what's it? Mixed, my, my, my grandmother is uh, Bosnian Muslim. My grandfather uh, was a Roman Catholic, uh, Slovene, and my, uh, my stepdad is actually an Orthodox Serb. So in, uh, in that means do, that's mixed. That's that's mixed. Right, yeah, that's really mixed. We do two nights in, 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 in my family too, but it's two nights of Christmas. <laughs> mm. One is like very sad, and one is really happy. <laughs> um, but uh, so in, in that the sense, orthodox one is the sad one, is the happy or sad. The, which one? The orthodox is the sad one. The like you, you have an unleavened cake, like cake like flat yeah. because it's unleavened, and you know like you put a candle in, in some wheat and right. you think sad thoughts. And um, <laughs> But it's okay because you got your presents before, so it's fine. Like, ten days before, you're all about the presents. So, um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, for, from from my family, yeah. and and I think that in in some ways, uh, what the book ended up being right. about was, uh, you know, sort of rituals that are, you know, you you, you pick and choose them, and um, they form your identity in a way that, um, you know, your identity is entirely formed of, of these family traditions, which in some ways in my family sit in sharp contrast to traditions that other people had as a result of coming from only one cultural right. anchor. Right. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a complex um, and in some ways really confusing thing because then when you try to, my brother who was born in California, you know, he, we, didn't, we didn't celebrate Christmas on the 25th until he started figuring out that he was getting his presents much, much later <laughs> on sad day when the rest of us were sad. Right. So it's a, you know, I, I think that it, it's that the handmade, my children always accuse me of anything that we've done twice is a tradition. Because right, family yeah, tradition. exactly. Exactly, we get, we get our, our turkey, our Thanksgiving turkey at a butcher's in Grand Central and then we have to take it home on the subway so that it gets fully New Yorkified and <laughs> smoked by the, by the subway. Herpes. Exactly, and, and everything, else that's, uh, everything else that's available. And we've done this twice, and I tell everyone it's one of our oldest family traditions. Right, to the, to the, it, but that's the nature of, make, of, 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 of modern ritual. Someone else over here, gentleman here. You can walk right out to the microphone right here. I was American born, and um, when I was a boy, I grew up in Ecuador, and I remember thinking in Spanish. And wondering what would it be like to think in English. And so now I forgot my Spanish, and now I think, what would it be like to think in, in Spanish? So my question is, <coughs> how would your novels be different? I'm sorry, different if you thought in the language that you no longer think in? That's deep. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gary, I you need, were saying that I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were saying it's a great question because I need a drink. Um, <laughs> you were saying at the beginning of the evening that there are still parts of your mind that can only encode themselves in Russian. Yeah, very much so. And and it shows, for better or for worse, it shows in in the in the on the page uh, because the the words aren't the sentences simply aren't phrased the way 
a native speaker would phrase them. It was very interesting. I was just in Paris with my Canadian counterpart, David Bismazgis, mm -hmm. uh, who also he emigrated from Latvia, and he said, I'm going to completely screw up what he said because he said it very eloquently. Explain uh, who David who David, David is. David Bismazgis uh, is another one of the New Yorker young writers um, from Latvia, a very great writer. His first book was Natasha. His second book was The Free World. And uh, he writes quite differently from me. It's a very different style, but I don't know how to describe it. Maybe more Hemingway-esque, maybe something like that. Um, but anyways, he was saying that he felt that he could maybe write. He, he envied people who grew up with English, and he felt that something was missing in the English uh, th that he offered on the page uh, because he grew up in another language. He said it, uh, as I said, much, much more eloquently, but it really kind of hit me over the head. And, and, and I, you know, I went back to my hotel room, and I cried for hours. Um, yes, I have my shrink. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I have a friend in France who's uh, somewhat bilingual and, and speaks, uh, uh, speaks English and said rightly that the part that's frustrating in that second language, no matter how close you come to mastery of it, is the final 10% of perversity. Mm -hmm. That there's 10% of perversity that we add to our native or to our primary language that we can never truly reproduce. That in the second language. Well, I think that a lot, he's right that maybe something is lost, but I've approached my vocation also as partly a historian because there aren't, I mean, that now there's more and more, when I wrote The Russian Debutante's Hand Job, there weren't any it's other first book. books <laughs> about that shit, you know? And, and, and so I thought, I, I gotta preserve this thing that's gonna disappear, the Soviet immigration, there aren't that many of us, you know? And so uh, for me, in using that fractured language that, that is part of me, I'm also preserving my grandmothers you know, who are gone. And that's, uh, that may sound like a, almost a sentimental kind of idea, but mm -hmm. it means something to me uh, because they live on in all, those, in all those silly jokes. You know, I grew up, first thing I ever heard that made any sense to me was a Brezhnev joke. Mm -hmm. It was 1970, 1980, right before the Moscow Olympics. Um, Brezhnev was completely senile, walks up on the stage. Ah, he's supposed to deliver the Olympic speech, and he looks at the sheet of paper, and he says, ah, Oh! And then, oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> and his assistant runs up, says, Comrade General Secretary, those are the Olympic rings. <laughs> <laughs> The lips of it. my grandmother. <laughs> and that's all you need. I mean, the performative part of it, the language, the fact that Russian allows you to do this, it's all there. All right. Don't you think that's been generally often been true of, of Jewish fiction in America? I think of someone like Henry Roth, that is, that you feel their proximity to their parents' language, to. to well, because there's an almost kind of incestuous bond here. I mean, my parents and I, for the longest time, interesting, because I'm married to a Korean woman and I find something very similar in her culture as well. There is no I, it's all we. You know, what does the family do? What does the family do? But it was very hard to, to, you know, to come to a country like this where the individual is king. And what the family does is Skype. Um, yeah, once every <laughs> Skype back the soul. Skype back yes. the money. Lady right here in the dead center. You know, this has an oddly ritual feeling to a dozen of people coming to the thing. You know, if you want to, if you have a question, why don't you just come right to the microphones and line, you can line up at the microphone. It'll be less ritual, but maybe more efficient. Yes. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, the supposed death of the novel and, you know, the jury's sort of out. Um, you know, there's nothing that I love more than going to the bookstore, you know, the feeling of the book in my hand. So I'm really a loyal person that way. But, um, I also, I subscribe to The New Yorker, and I come home, and when it's there, I immediately turn to the fiction, and I read the short stories every single issue. Um, it's something I really look forward to. So I wanted to hear your opinions on the short story, and you mentioned that um, the novel can't really compete with you know, the fragmented media that we consume. Um, and I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for the short story to sort of have a revival in a way, right. and just all that sort of space. If the, if the novel is coughing consumptively, like Camille, the short story seems to be on life support, um, at, le at least much harder to, it wasn't true even when I started up 30 years ago, people could publish collections of short stories, they were read and so on too. Short story, is in, all of you have published short fiction in The New Yorker, among other places. Is the short story as a form important to you? To me, not especially, to be honest. You know, I, I, if I, I find writing so hard that if I were able to get something in shape enough for 
20 pages, I would just try to make it Keep more. Going, yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't see a reason to stop. So it's not that, I, I mean, I value short stories. I love reading short stories, but I don't feel like I have the luxury of a novel here, a short story there, a couple short stories, novel, maybe a poem. You know, it, it's very hard to come up with something that feels compelling. And so when I have it, I, I, I really try to make it yeah. work. Husband did, yeah, so yeah. that's the thing. I, yeah. I love it. I, I um, you know, I, I started as a short story writer, and I mean, we, we all did um, in my MFA program and in, in, in college where I was before. And I, I think that there's something uh, unbelievably gratifying about the form from, from the standpoint of the writer, because the way I write short stories is the first draft is done within the first 48 hours. And then there's time to sort of orchestrate all of it and see what is really there and move it around. And, and you know, you, you have the, the sense of the whole world of it being constructed and completed more or less uh, in two days. And then the editing process, which I absolutely adore, begins. And that can last like two or three years, but it doesn't matter because you did something and you feel really good about it, which for a novel. <laughs> Um, I, I did not have that sense. Like I, I, I could, I, you know, I, there was no end in sight, and uh, nobody knew to tell me what it was going to look like when it was in sight, and you know, I might miss it. I don't know, and keep going. So, um, and I think that it's 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 very important from a reader's standpoint too. I mean, I think that I the enjoyment of a short story has that same, you know, pull and that same energy when you're reading. Um, and I think that in our very <laughs> short span of attention society, it's a great, great thing. I don't know if it'll have a revival, but it certainly stands a shot. <laughs> but they're very hard. They're harder than novels, I think, because of the tie. The you have to do the same thing that a novel does, essentially. But in so I mean, and Chekhov did it so That's good. Yeah. Chekhov <laughs> did it so good, and now you got the Alice Munro. You got the Edgar Carrot. Let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> I will write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Lady here. Um, I also want to um, ask about the the depth of the novel and um, John's specifically about how the internet is sort of like changing the way that our brains work, um, so that our like our longing for the kind of like slow intimacy of a novel is leaving us, I guess. Um, so I wonder how the like Tumblr gone book or even like the sh Fifty Shades of Grey plays into that. Mm. What was the first thing you said? The what? Tumblr gone book. So like. What is it called? Tumblr. You know Tumblr. Yeah. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Like there's um so like uh I think last week there was a book reading for two Tumblr gone books. So like there's a Tumblr called um, Fuck 'Em in My Twenties, which is just like you know very like <laughs> grotesque. I'm sure we can all figure out what it's about. Well, <laughs> well what's the URL for that? <laughs> Fucking girls on 20? What? Because <laughs> I have the eye telephone now. I, th I think it was in rather than on. Fucking actually. in girls, 20. Fuck, fuck, I'm in my 20s. Oh, oh, fuck, right. I actually misheard it the same way you did. <laughs> I was like, not, not, that's not what it is. Okay. <laughs> um, but, I mean, and then there's like another, there's another book, uh, Tumblr that, I don't, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's the book is uh, Surrey's Burn Book, which is like, um, someone made the character of Surrey Cruz and they like started a blog for her where she like talks about other famous babies and it's like really funny and stupid and that's now a book as well. So, I mean, these are things that started on the internet and are now books. Um, and so the intimacy, intimacy, you know, is now in book form, but they started on the internet. And I think the people who are buying the books are probably the people who started reading on the internet. So how does that play into your theory that novels are dying? No, I mean, there'll be a lot of different forms and I'm not worried about different forms. I like the idea of e-books in theory a, a lot. Why not? I like the idea of Oh, whatever books. I mean, I, the, the, to me, it doesn't, you know, to be honest, I didn't even want to be a novelist, per se. I just wanted to make things that felt authentic to me and that felt like they were expressing what I wanted to express. And so far, they've taken the form of novels. And if they don't, that's fine, too. The problem is if we lose our ambition to express those things or we lose our hunger for, the problem is if our definitions get diminished, like our definition of friendship has been diminished by Facebook, you know? Our definition of love gets diminished, our definition of the big themes, you know. Um, in certain ways, we depend on works of art to revitalize our definitions or to bolster them. You know, everybody knows what it's like to hear a song or see a painting or watch a dance and be reminded of the stakes of life, you know, because in the domestic busy day, there's so many things that are dampening down experience and like closing in the spectrum of feeling. And then you encounter a work of art and you say, oh, yeah, that's 
that's what I really like. That's what it's all about. My heart is racing. The blood is flowing. You feel like things are possible, you know? And so the thing to worry about it is the closing in of the spectrum and the diminishing of, of definitions. And if we get too used to the idea of novels being, I can't remember what the string of adjectives you used, but they were great, like dumb, kind of funny, something. Um, you know, it may be that that's what we end up seeking. That if we, if we start to, if we seek, I mean, that's the worst case scenario. The more likely scenario is that we'll just seek entertainment. Like, we'll just seek gratification. And the problem is, you know, it, it's, it's like blowing less air into the balloon. You know, and we'll get used to a less full balloon. But the balloon is us. The balloon is life. The balloon is culture. And um, that's what I would worry about, that in, in the effort to compete with all of these other kinds of media, we just diminish our ambitions and we diminish our expectations and, and, and diminish our hunger. Thank you. Lady here. I, I just wanted to ask the um, authors of what about the next generation? Um, I grew up uh, bilingual myself and very much between the two uh, cultures. And my children are very different. They um, only speak English. Um, what, what was your other language? I, I spoke Greek as a child and mm -hmm. you know, still do speak it very um, fluently. But my children do not speak it at all. And sometimes I'm sad about that. And so I, I was going to ask about whether you have children or are having children, um, wh whether they're growing up, how much they're growing up in the old culture, or how much is it that, you know, you are the last, um, you know, in, in the line. I don't have children, but I have a dachshund, <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he speaks Serbo-Croatian, which is so strange. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> he just came up to me and said, Dobar dan. <laughs> and I was like, damn, you're Serbo-Croatian. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, um, uh, if I did have a child, um, I, I don't think I would teach her or him Russian. I would put it on the menu of things. Uh, my wife is from a different culture as well. We could put all these different... We could put some cabbage and some kimchi on the table and say, no, what, what would you like to eat? Um, you know, this, these things happen much later in life, too. That's interesting. Um, I spent so much of my childhood in, when I was in Hebrew school trying to repress the fact that I was Russian. I would tell kids in Hebrew school that I was German, you know, because it was better to be German <laughs> in a yeshiva than Russian during the Ronald Reagan evil empire era. But when I discovered, you know, when I, I went to this Marxist college in Ohio, O-Berlin or something, <laughs> and, and I, I think it's on the penultimate syllable, the stress. Anyway, at, o, at o Berlin, all of a sudden being Russian or being whatever was the best thing you can do. Nobody wanted to be native born, so I put on the whole Cossack thing with the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's how it happens. A child rediscovers uh, her roots, and, and then, then, then it really happens. Then the trips to Israel, blah, blah, blah. But uh, it should never be forced. You should never say to a child, you must learn the Cyrillic alphabet. I actually disagree. I mean, I, I think you won't learn it unless you're forced to learn it. And it's nice, the idea of you take a trip every now and then they learn three words and they forget them. But my, I have two kids, and my experience is, you know, if he, wants, if he chooses if he wants to play piano, he'll never play piano. And then he'll, he'll, he will not be a young person who you know, has piano. any kind of musical proficiency. And, like he's at a point, there, there are points when the brains are, it's not like learning something when you're an adult. It's easier, and I think it's informing a lot of other kinds of knowledge, a lot of other ways of thinking. So we, um, I regret that I wasn't forced to, do, uh, to learn languages when I was a kid. I went to Hebrew school as well, but it was, it was really, really informal, and there was no chance of, of, of learning language. But we have um, Hebrew-speaking babysitters, and, and they take... They take lessons as well, and you know, do they like it always? Not really, but the goal of a parent isn't isn't to give, in my, in my understanding, like a life that the kid likes all the time. You hope that that can be the case, but it's not the only incentive. You know, otherwise they wouldn't go to school and they would never they would eat, you know, just mac and cheese all day long. <laughs> no, I, I I mean I agree. I, I, a child should be taught, but in my case, you know, accounting, Excel, stuff like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so so Jonathan, your kids are being. <laughs> are being brought up um, English, Hebrew, yeah. uh, bilingual. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a little a bit of an exaggeration, but we're trying, trying, to, to, trying to, to make that happen. It works the other way around, too, of course, is that it's a deeply and instructively abashing experience for a parent. We lived for many years in Paris, in France, and my 
son spoke very good French, naturally, and I spoke French the way an immigrant speaks mm -hmm. French. And I would go to school with him and talk to the teachers. And I thought my French was pretty good. And I would see the look on his face of utter humiliation at every moment. <laughs> and I realized we were just recapitulating what my grandfather had been through with his great-grandfather. Because what he heard, what my son heard in his ear when I was talking to his teachers is, so the boy does good in the homeworks, does he? <laughs> <laughs> he, is doing the good, he is doing the good work all day long, is he? Is he? Yeah. There's, there's something we must do. Is, and, that's, and he was just in a state of constant <laughs> humiliation at it, which was very healthy for me. Right? I, I think about this all the time. You, my, you're not Scott Fitzgerald. You're you know, Myron Cohen, <laughs> if only. You know. Anyway, go ahead. No, my grandparents were immigrants to America, but fluent in their Judaism. Right. And we are fluent in our American identity and immigrants and in our Judaism. Yeah, that's lovely. And it's not necessarily the case that you can't be fluent in both, or at least you can try. You know, there was a generational pause. Like things weren't possible in my parents' generation that are now possible in mine and with my children because they were overcoming a trauma and there was all kinds of assimilation was a necessity. Mm -hmm. and, and now we have the luxury of being able to try to find, you know, again, a kind of fluency in, in the things that were lost. Lady here. Um, I have a colleague who's from Peru and she loves stories and she's a good writer, but when I asked, when are you going to write your own stories? And she was said, I'm waiting for my relatives to die. <laughs> uh, so all the times when there's good story, often because there's also trauma involved. So how do you balance as a writer the sensitivity to your relatives or friends, um, maybe the story they're based on, and your uh, desire or responsibility to be an honest and good storyteller? The, Phil the Philip Roth question, uh, <laughs> again and again. Anyone want to? Laurie, Laurie Anderson has this great s song or story, whatever it is that, that um, it is, and she says, she talks about an old couple who are um, 100 years old right. and are um, getting a divorce. And all their friends say, oh, you're 100 years old. You don't want to just wait it out? I mean, you know, 100 years. Why did you, if you really didn't like her, why did you wait this long? And they say, we were just waiting for the kids to die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I can't imagine, I, I literally can't imagine a writer who doesn't have that problem, who doesn't think of fiction, nonfiction, any kind of writing, just because you're naturally drawn to the things that are, or I don't know, I wouldn't speak for everybody, but I'm naturally drawn to the, you know, the things I care about most, which tend to be um, private. Things something. you're not supposed to talk about, right? Well, or, 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 <laughs> or even more, like things that are problematic. Like, I don't care that much about things that are resolved in my life. Like, because they're resolved and I'm happy with them. I don't care about good forms of love, you know. I mean, I do, but I, I am content just to exist within them. But then, you know, the problems, the things that keep you up at night that you, that you worry about, those are the things that, at least for me, I, my writing always goes to them. So, um, We have a simple rule in our house to deal with that. It's no piercings below the waist and no bitter memoirs. <laughs> everything, else, everything else can go. Yes, here. So this question is for Mr. Steingart. Um, in your most recent novel, of all the aspects of the future, which ones do you think are most likely to come to pass? Well, the problem is they've almost all come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Nostradamus of like two weeks from now. <laughs> Ooh, I gonna get dental fillings. <laughs> no, no. Every damn thing has happened. Um, Occupy Wall Street pretty much happened in a different format. Uh, the, the default on our debt happened. The, cons uh, the consolidation of the airlines. The consolidation of the airlines has happened almost entirely the way I, I wrote it. Uh, and in good news, onion skin jeans, the transparent jeans <laughs> worn by teeny boppers, are coming online next month <laughs> from a French company. Uh, so you will be able to see women's behinds. It's all happening, and that makes me uh, sad. But you know, for a satirist, which is the, where I get lumped into that category, you know, you, life is good when evil and stupidity collide. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the W years. <laughs> and frighteningly enough, you know, if a certain ticket wins the election, I'm back in business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, baby! <laughs> 
especially President Ryan in 2016. That's just good. Yeah. We're, I'm afraid we're drawing to uh, the witching hour and the end of our time, but let me take this lady here, if I may. Hey, I was just wondering whether or not you guys ever find yourself thinking of a concept or reaching for a certain phraseology that might best be expressed not in English, and if so, what you do about that. Do you roll with it? Do you try to find a way to express it in English? Keep it in the native tongue? I, go ahead. I find that thank you. I find that happens to me when I've arrived at that point where I'm most satisfied with a paragraph, and then I come to the final sentence in the paragraph, which for me takes about six hours for one paragraph, and then the final word in the paragraph I think of, and the perfect one is in Serbian, and then I'm like, fuck. <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a frustrating problem because, um, and I find my, you know, I find my. English is sometimes also framed by Serbo-Croatian um, rhythms and cadence and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's like the perfect word is right there. And I, I, um, I never take it. You know, it's always, it's always either the whole paragraph has to change or now we've got another six hours to figure out how that word can best be translated into English. And then it's, are you translating for direct translation? Are you translating for context? Is it good? Is it you know? It's it's um so it's it's a it's a problem that that does come up, and I, I don't know any. Sorry, can you can, no no just it's do you know? Can you recall a specific Serbo-Croatian word that's sort of irreplaceable? There's a there's a great one that's um. There's a great one that my that my mother always references, and and she she's just like there, there is no word in English for this, and it's very simple, but it's chorba, and chorba is like stew, but not stew, and s like soup, but not soup. Yeah. And and I don't know if you have, is it? I don't know. Maybe not. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> if that's the worst of your problem. No, no I, can't, I can't translate menus anymore. Damn it. Kind of soup. It's kind of stew. No, but like that's the, that's the most immediate one. No so chorba for you. No chorba ever. And it's like I can't get back into the house unless I can translate this. But there's no. But it, it has it has overtones that are even go beyond soup. Yeah, and stew. exactly. It's like it's like, like the greatest thing that your grandmother has ever made. But it's not a soup. It's not a stew. Something else, but it's also a soup and a stew. It's still the greatest thing your grandmother ever made, and your grandma will be really upset if you can't translate it. Was, it wasn't my grandmother. She couldn't. Everything she made was inedible. But yeah, <laughs> but, I'm with you. But that's but that's a lovely thing. Spell it, spell it for us. Uh, I can't because oh, the first letter has a little. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's a C with a hat, and then Orba, Orba. O R B A. Uh, that's that, that's a, one last question, and then then we have to call for night. Um, I I wanted to comment on this concept of globalization of the novel and how maybe this genre of immigration and exile is sort of coming to an end. And I really disagree with that concept. Mm -hmm. I think the future is a future of immigration and exile. We are all immigrants, or all our children sooner or later may very well be. And if there's anything about globalization, it is, uh, it's the story of the Africans who move and the Filipinos who move and the Latin Americans who move and even the Americans someday will move to some other place when it becomes hard to live here. And sure. so, in fact, I think this genre is very much at the core of the future novel. And I think that I, I, I'm a good example of it. My parents were European Jews who moved to Argentina. And I moved to Arge from Argentina to the US because one couldn't live in Argentina anymore. And I think the history of the world is very much this. I don't think that we are at an end of this genre, but the beginning, I think we're beginning. The, the, hi the history, the act of expatriation and immigration will remain central to literature? No, I think forward. so. I thought you were asking about us specifically in our, right, I mean, clearly he's right. Yeah. I mean, it just has, he has to be right. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I understood your question to mean like in, a, in our own Work and your work, own, yeah. your own work. No, no, but in, it can be it can be both in the in the world at large and in yeah. in your own work. Can let me ask one last highly specific question because it fascinates me. So in reading through your stuff, I noticed at least two of you. Um, Bulgakov's great book, *The Master and Margarita*, means a, means a great deal to you. This is a book that was almost totally unknown until the, until the 1960s, really. Why is that book so important to you? 
For me, really? Yeah. Could you not say this? Uh -oh. Was it you, Tia? You, you it's just me. Just yeah. Um, I love it, but. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, do, uh, did you? Is it not? Well, um, it's a. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I, I just think it's uh, the master margarita has this particular kind of effect on me that um, you know I am extraordinarily grateful to exist in a world that has that book in it. I would not have been happy to live prior to that book being what it is today. Like, I think that, that, that it has the context that it has um, in literature today says a great thing about the world itself, and it makes me happy to be part of yeah. literature in any way if that book is in it. So that's its Well, um, I just was curious because it's my favorite book, and it's uh, in it, I think, has, is, remains endlessly uh, applicable. We are all grateful and happy to be living in a world which has your books in it, and we all thank you so much for coming to me.